Um, but jumping into today's message, I want to tell a story. So recently, um, my family and I, we, we moved. And so we had lived in South City um, for, for many, many years, for about 10 years. And, uh, and so I still know all the gang signs. If you want later, we can go over them. But um, so I, I lived in South City for about 10 years. And we sold the house that we had lived in for 10 years for almost the exact amount that we bought it for, right? And so that's either like a, a testimony or a sad moment depending on your perspective. It's like, yay, we didn't lose money. Yay, housing market as an investment is a joke. And so anyway, um, and so here's the thing is that, um, uh, you know, by the time you pay the realtors and all that, I think we broke even after, you know, renting it for 10 years. But there's a lot of factors that went into that. Like we bought it like right at the beginning of the whole housing crisis and all that. Many of you have, have, have been through that as well. Uh, there was a ton of foreclosures around us. I, I found out the day after it happened that I could have bought my neighbor's house on my credit card. Um, it, it sold for so cheap and I was frustrated. Um, and so, um, and then also just persistent problems in the city. Public schools have made city houses um, and their value sometimes problematic. And so we sold that house and we moved into the neighborhood here by the church. After 18 years of employment, I figured it was safe to, to assume I was staying here. And so anyway, um, and so we moved closer to the church. And, and 17 months now into owning this new house, the home across, from, across the street from ours went up for sale. And so Karen was looking at it online, and we found out that it was selling for $50,000 more than we just bought our house for. And we're like, all oh, right, that's a hot market. Like 10 years, no accumulation, you know, 17 months, our house is maybe worth that too. But then we began to look into it, right? You start to look at the pictures and we found out that, oh man, they've, they've updated everything. They've got those marble or granite or whatever countertops and they've got all the new appliances. And actually they have like a whole room because on the front, the house looks like our house because that's how it is when you live in the suburbs. And, and, and so they just put the numbers so you know which one is yours. And so anyway, um, and so so it looks like ours. But then we find out there's this whole other addition and they've got like way more house in the backyard and all that. But the biggest thing is they had this privacy fence, which obscured our view. And this whole time, we didn't know that they had an in-ground pool in the backyard, which makes me wish I would have gotten to know them sooner, um, but I didn't. And so, so, so there's all these factors that make their house probably worth a lot more than ours, right? And, and that's, you guys know this. I mean, there are all these factors that just make one house worth what it's worth. And, and two houses can actually look identical from the outside, but they can have very different values on the housing market based on where they're located and, and so many other things like we've just alluded to. But, but I want to talk about a slightly different factor because sometimes house, a house's value can vary greatly on factors that aren't traditional, right? And, and based instead on things like who once lived there. So here's a picture of a house, um, I think. And so it might be coming. Scott, Scott does not look confident this picture is coming. It's not coming. All right. Uh, I don't know what happened to that picture. But anyway, so there was a picture of a house and, and it actually was a very humble looking house. It was probably, you know, seven or eight hundred square feet. It was kind of a small country home and, and, and it had nothing special. The inside was still like it would have been when the house was built 90 years ago. And you look at it and you go, that doesn't seem very valuable, but it turns out that people actually pay money to walk through that house every day. That the government owns it now and they run it as a museum because it is the childhood home of Johnny Cash, right? And so, so you wonder, like, is that where he first fell into the burning ring of fire, right? And so, so it was Johnny Cash's childhood home. And, and it's a museum now, so we don't know what it's worth. But if it were to sell again to a private owner, it would probably sell for millions of dollars, right? And, and the point that I'm making is that sometimes there are things that turn this whole market value system upside down and they ascribe value to things that traditional factors just can't account for. The location of this house doesn't make it valuable. The contents don't make it valuable. The construction doesn't make it valuable. 
but who once owned it makes it valuable. And so we're going to kind of talk about that. We're going to read chapter uh, 15 of the book of Luke. We're going to start in verse 1 and 2, and then we're going to jump ahead to verses 8 and 10. And it says this, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so they're complaining. And so Jesus told a, a parable first that you're familiar with, the lost sheep. And then he told this parable also in response. He said, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp? Sweep the house and search for it carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And so again, Jesus is telling this parable and two others, two others about lost things, in direct response to the religious leaders who were questioning the value of the people that Jesus was paying attention to. So that's their complaint. Jesus, you got these people with you, and we don't, we don't think they're worth anything. We don't think they're worth your time. We don't think they're worth God's time. Why are you paying attention to these people? And so Jesus tells this parable to kind of rebut their thought. He's saying, listen, you're thinking about this the wrong way, so wrong that I'm going to tell you three consecutive stories to help make the point here, all right? And so in this parable, the woman represents God, okay? And, and, and here's the, the, the thing of this. These silver coins were altogether almost worthless on their own. They were just maybe equivalent to a penny or something that we would have today, all right? And so when he tells this story without losing just one of the ten, those people would have all immediately assumed that if you lose that penny, you just what? You move on. You write it off, right? You don't worry about it. It's just a penny. In good circumstances, it's hardly worth bending over. I mean, guys, be honest. You have seen a penny on the ground, and you have that thought, I should pick it up, and then you go, no, right? Especially if you're like me, sometimes I have back problems, I'm stiff and I'm nervous, don't like bending over, it's, a, it's always a fraught with possibilities, right? So something has to be really valuable before I'm going to bend over and pick it up, right? And, and so, so that, like, they're looking at this, they're going, man, you don't even bend over to pick that up, you just let it go, and you just consider it part of the kid's allowance, and they'll find it eventually, right? And so, so that's what they're saying. They're thinking in their heads, you just write that loss off. And especially in this circumstance where Jesus is making up this story. So in this ancient home in ancient Israel, it would have been usually like a small one or two room mud hut. And they would have had usually just one window in the house. Um, and the floor would be dirt, be packed down dirt. Now, how many of you guys know in, in the Middle East, it's, it's hot right? And so you're always sweaty and stuff. So if you have a dirt floor and you're sweaty all the time, what does that turn into? Mud. So what they would do is they would rip all these plants like palm leaves and other reeds and things, any kind of a long flat leaf like that, they would rip those things off from places and they would just intertwine them on their floor. It wouldn't really be like a woven mat unless you were really wealthy. The average person would just have these things as a patchwork all over their floor. Probably an inch or two at least of these things just layered up on top of each other, just a, a big mess of these leaves. And this kind of provided a base mat so that you're not in contact with the dirt all the time. So now think about this story. You lose a penny in a room that's got an inch or two of just interwoven weeds, basically, just covering the floor. And beneath that, it's all caked together in dust and dirt. You drop a penny in that, trying to find that is going to be a major event you're sifting your floor, right? You're going through, I mean, you could get a metal detector and it's still probably going to take some time. And so in that scenario, they're assuming, man, you just write that off, right? And so here's the point is that there, Jesus was playing into what they were already doing because there were entire groups and types of people that these religious leaders equated to that coin. 
And they just wrote those people off. The leper, I know it's sad, but it's their fault. They were a sinner. Right? Poor person, man, it's your fault for being born poor. Right? God must not have favored you. You must be doing something wrong. Your parents, somebody. Right? And there was all these different things, whether it was sickness, disease, socioeconomic conditions, whatever it was, there were these people, and when something bad would happen or when their life would be in a mess, you just got wrote off. And they assumed that they were doing this because this is what God did as well. That there was really good people who stayed up in the mix and God kept them. And then once you weren't good enough anymore, God just wrote you off as well. So in this parable, Jesus is showing them and us the heart of God for people that we would assume matter less. And so that's the overall kind of meaning of this parable in general. And now we're going to kind of break it down and go part by part. So first of all, the first idea I want to make clear is that darkness is the state of this world, but not an indictment on God. So darkness is the condition of our world, but it's not an indictment of God. In this parable, one of the major causes of the lostness of this coin is how dark it was in the house. That's why Jesus set the parable in the house. If he had been outside, if she had been outside and dropped the coin with the sun shining down at 115 degrees and everything else, she would have looked and seen the coin. It would have been simple to bend over and pick it up, right? But inside the house, it was dark, right? Because these houses were like these one or two room things with an 18 inch window that served the whole house. So if you can imagine, it's all the way enclosed the only light you get is the light that comes through this window that's about this big. So the inside of this house would have been really dim and shadowy, um, even during the day, but especially as daylight begins to fail. Now, again, the problem here, it's not that there's not enough light in general. There's plenty of light outside, but only so much light makes it inside of this house, which makes it dark in there. It makes it a dark circumstance. And so I want to say there's a lot of conditions in our world that we would consider to be darkness. I mean, some of them is just spiritual darkness. There's places that are lost and they don't know the, the truth of Jesus, but there's also physical darkness. Like there are, are places all over the world where people just don't have access to clean water. And there are some pe places in the world where, where people on a widespread scale just go without food. There are many places in the world where people don't have access to education, or only certain people do. And there's some places in the world where people of differing ethnic groups are mistreated or overlooked because of what they are. Sometimes those places are here, but sometimes it's even other places as well. And so, so sometimes darkness, it plays out, and we can see it just in these very stark physical conditions. But then sometimes there's also a spiritual component to that darkness as well. And so just from our perspective, we can look at the world and we can see examples of people who are like that coin that's lost in the dust, right? The girl Cecilia in the video before Convoy stepped in in her life, she would have been one of those people that would have ended up lost in the dust, right? And so, so there's people who are just those ones who end up lost in the dust. And it can appear that the world itself has just completely written these people off. And often that is the case. And it might even look like these people matter less to God because of the conditions that they live in. And so you've had people probably ask you, they've had objections to Christianity. Why would God allow this? Right? And maybe some of you have wondered that. Why would God allow this? Why would God allow these children to starve? Why would God allow these children to die of waterborne illnesses? Why would God allow for women like Cecilia to be sold by their fathers to get more cattle and then be, be doomed to a, a crazy life that we wouldn't want for our daughters? Why does God allow this? And so we wonder this. But I want to I wanna tie this back to the parable here. In this parable, the fact that it is dark 
in the house is not an indictment on the son. The son was more than bright enough. The sun was more than enough light. There, someone constructed that house in a way that not enough light is getting in. In fact, in the parable, it says that the woman then lit a candle, and that candle represents Jesus. Because we've allowed the situation to get so dark that God had to re-enter the scene physically himself to shed light on how this thing is supposed to be working. So, so in this parable, someone used raw materials and they built that house in such a way that it only allowed so much light in. And so, so maybe you've struggled with that. Maybe you've struggled with this, this indictment with God. Maybe you've struggled when people have asked you, why does God allow this? And I would say that, listen, someone constructed those systems. Someone used raw materials that God put here and they created a system that's allowed some people to matter less and some people to matter more. And so we're going to read a scripture where it actually explains whose job is whose. This is Genesis chapter 1. It goes way back to the beginning, which is convenient. God told us this rule at the beginning because it was a good time to know it. So anyway, Genesis 1, 27 and 28 says, So God created human beings in his own image. And there's significance to that. God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So we both equally bear the image of God. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and then this, and govern it. Fill the earth and govern it. Now, there's different translations translate that word in, in a few different ways. There's govern it, some say subdue it, and some actually say cultivate it like you would a garden. Churn it up, put the good things in, take the bad things out, plant the seeds, produce from it, which gives us this concept that God gave us this planet with raw materials, and he put us here as governors, as cultivators, to then produce from what? He has given us. But right there it tells us, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and the animals that scurry along the ground. And so the point I want to make on this scripture is that God created this big, beautiful ball in space. And then he positioned us on it. And God assigned the care and the cultivation and the governing of this earth to us. We're the governors. He gave the raw material and the potential for everything that we have and so much more. And he built us in his image with the capacity to govern this thing. And then he made us responsible to cultivate all of this into something good. So I want to ask a question. When the people, the cultures, and the countries of this world are broken, and when ugly things happen, did God allow it? Or did we allow it? Who is the governor? You see, this problem, I'm not trying to make us feel guilty. I'm just trying to help us understand this is the way it was set up from the beginning. Human suffering and injustice and all of these horrible things that happen are not an indictment on God's goodness. They're an indictment on our goodness. You see, when we... Now, now, again, the candle was even sent. So God laid all this out in the beginning. We didn't catch it. So then he put a candle in the room, and that candle was Jesus. So he sent Jesus to say, in case you missed it, some people aren't worthless that you can just leave them in the dust. And so he sent Jesus to straighten it back out again and shed light on the situation to help us to understand the, the, the value system that he has so we can govern the world in the way that he intends for us 
too. So when we understand God's value system, we can begin to bring light and beauty to areas of the world where darkness currently reigns. And we are the assigned caretakers. And Jesus has come to shed light on God's heart again so that we have the ability now to cultivate this world into something beautiful that will honor God and that will flourish people. That's one of the things that's built into this. And so the next point is this. God's value system, we have to understand it. God's value system is altogether different than ours. And when I say ours, it's not a value system that you hold personally. It's one that you have inherited by growing up in the world that you've grown up in, in the country that you've grown up in, in the city and in the family that you've grown up in. And so we have this thing that we inherit, but what we have to recognize is God's value system is altogether different than ours. You see, our cultural mindset, it creates a system by which we subconsciously determine the value of people. We are always doing it. We don't know we're doing it. We usually don't recognize it when we're doing it. And if we're ever called on for doing it, if we're ever corrected, we explain it away, don't we? Right? And, and, and so we'll quickly dismiss somebody, and, and then when someone calls us on our coldness towards them, we'll say, well, they brought it on themselves. Well, that's what happens when you live that way. That's what happens when this, that's why, and what we've determined is that their situation doesn't bear the same value as ours, and so we shouldn't have any sorrow or remorse for it. You see, our cultural value system, it actually looks a whole lot like the housing market value system. You see, your value within our culture, your value as a person depends somewhat on where you come from, right? Location, location, location. And even in St. Louis, we have a way to ask this without, without looking like we're being ignorant. We say, what high school did you go to? Because it's better than saying, right? Like when people say, how many of you guys have ever asked that? And someone said, oh, I went to Frontenac High School. And you're like, oh, right? There's automatically a reaction. And then when they say, like, I went to Roosevelt High School, you, like, reach for your gun. You're like, no, oh, <laughs> grip your purse a little bit tighter, right? I went to Roosevelt High School. So anyway, like, we have, and so we, we immediately are gauging how valuable is this person. Are they one of the elites? Are they one of those socialites that's out there, right? And so we have this value system based on where you're from. We have, your value is somewhat derived by how you look, right? Let's be honest. Pretty people are worth more. It's just true. How many of you guys have ever said, man, that kid has so much potential. And then the first thing you say is, they're so good looking. And then you add on, they're smart and they're athletic. They're a leader, right? But what you mean is like, man, pretty people are impressive, right? That's why you guys are all here. Look at me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, pretty people are impressive. I want to tell a story. So some of you guys see this. I used to have a beard the last little bit. And it's because as you get older, sometimes you get fatter. And I was trying to camouflage some of that. But I recently lost a few pounds, and I thought maybe my face doesn't look fat anymore, and I shaved it, and I was disappointed. But anyway, um, and so, <laughs> there's still too much yardage to cover up there. But um, uh, no, anyway, but that, the, pretty, right? If you're pretty, if you look good, if you look fit, all these other things, you're worth more. And it's not just being pretty. Sometimes it has to do with the complexion of your skin, right? People of certain skin complexions are worth more than others in a lot of places and to a lot of people, right? Maybe it's like your past or your lack of a past can make you worth more, right? Some, some people feel like, man, my past makes me worth less. Go ahead and raise your hand. No, don't do that. Uh, and so and tell us why. Um, you know, my, and so, the, so your past can kind of determine this. Your value is often determined by how productive you are. Right? You don't have to be pretty if you're really good at your job and make a lot of money, right? And that can justify you. And so since you're not pretty, then you buy pretty things like a pretty car just to let you, hey, I'm not pretty, but I'm good at my job, right? And so we have all these other ways that we can kind of show our value, that our value is determined, right? How many of you guys have ever like kind of known somebody and then you like see their house and you're like, oh, I didn't know you were doing that well, <laughs> And all of a sudden, be honest, all of a sudden, you're a little bit intimidated by them. You're like, 
I didn't even realize you were a better person than me. We've been friends all this time. I didn't realize you mattered more. Right? I mean, it's okay. I know there's like, there's like the real quiet check laughs because we don't like to admit that we ever think these things. And I don't ever feel this way. I've done reading on this, and that's how I know. That's how I know that this is how you guys feel. <laughs> Listen, the, and one really kind of delicate truth is that the more like us someone looks, the more likely we are to ascribe value to them. And here's what I mean. It's, it's sad, and I've seen this in myself. We can hear about catastrophes and tragedies in other places in the world where people are poor and where, in all honesty, they tend to not look like me. And hundreds of people could die in something, and it's said in five seconds on the news, and we forgot it five seconds later. All right? And it's sad, but it's true that in America, when white people die somewhere, it's more of a tragedy. You can have a few white people that die in something, and that's horrible in and of itself, but you can have hundreds. You can have hundreds of schoolgirls, you know, uh, abducted and taken. And we report it in like five minutes, and then we move on. And we don't follow the story. We forget about it. And again, I'm hoping you're not feeling guilty because this is something that you've grown into. This is something you've inherited from the culture. It's something I have inherited from the culture. You know, um, how many of you guys have big feet? Anybody? Raise your hands. Someone yell out a size. 30. 15. All right, that's weird. No. Uh, <laughs> do you ever feel guilty about that, Doug? No. Why? It came that way. That's right. That's right. You didn't do it. Someone else did it a long time ago. It's genetic. It was handed down. And, and you know, and, and I really want to try to get, kind of get this across. Like, feeling guilty about what we're talking about today, it makes about as much sense as feeling guilty for your shoe size. It doesn't make any sense. Because this is the air that you've grown up breathing. This is the water that you've grown up swimming in. And so it influences. And sometimes we recognize it a little bit. And so we begin to make some course corrections and change the way that we think, right? But to a certain degree, we all struggle with this fact and with this reality. And now, so now to say, don't feel guilty, but I, I do want to say it's not right. Okay. And so we have to separate these two and go, Hey, it's, it's okay to not feel guilty, but this tendency is not right, but it's still true about us. We all value some people more than other people. And, and just as a, a real-life example, a while back in the city of Milwaukee, the drinking water what was tainted with some particularly troublesome um, parasite. And, and in the course of this happening, uh, 400,000 residents of the city became ill because of this parasite, and over 100 people died because of tainted water. And that's a tragedy. That's really really a tragedy. But the city and the people really responded, right? $54 million was spent treating the people who were sick, cleaning up the water system, and even doing research to be sure that this wouldn't happen again. Now let's do some comparison. The World Health Organization currently says that every single day in developing nations around the world, 2,271 people die from water-related illnesses, and the majority of those are children. 2,271 people a day. A day. That is a person dying every 40 seconds. But the truth is that those people tend to be invisible to us. 
And, and again, this is me. Like, I've heard statistics and figures like that before and then forgotten them and thought, huh, that's terrible. That's sad. Right? They tend to be invisible. But listen, if, if middle-class American children were dying every 40 seconds, how differently would we respond? Like, even if it wasn't our kid, we would join a campaign, man. We would go somewhere. We would do something. We would mount some kind of a mission to change this trend and this catastrophe. We would stand up and do whatever it took. But, but the ugly truth is that some people in this world matter more than other people. And that's reality. And again, none of this is said to make us feel guilty. Guys, we've inherited a personal market value system that attributes more value to some people than others. And a lot of it's based on things you can't control, where you're born, what you look like, the conditions of the world around you at the time. Um, and some of it is even based on factors that we can control, right? There's sometimes where we write people off and it's not because they're, they're the wrong color or they live in the wrong hemisphere or anything like that. It's sometimes because of poor choices that people make. Some people make bad choices. Some people have been lazy or they've been what we see as especially immoral and then they have hardship. But the truth is sometimes their hardship really doesn't register with us as much as the hardship of people that we view as being good people. How many of you guys have experienced this? Someone you know that their life has been a train wreck and something terrible happens. And we go, well, that's what you get. And we may not say that, but that's how we kind of like relieve ourselves from the situation. And, and what that is, is what those religious leaders were doing. We're dropping the coin and we're going, that's too bad. And we walk away. But Jesus told this parable to point this system out to us and invite us to walk toward something better. Guys, God does not have a market-based value system for you. Productive people are not loved by God more than unproductive people. Pretty people are not more valuable in his kingdom. Wealthy people's problems don't matter more than poor people's problems. And the lesson of this parable is not that, that God is just this penny pincher that, that climbs down on the floor and sifts around for the penny because the penny is worth a penny and he still wants his penny. So there's actually something more going on here. So we're going to dig into this. This single coin in this parable had a value to this woman that was unrelated to its financial value. She was not searching for it because of its monetary value. See, in that culture, in that time, women were given a special gift on their wedding day. And so there were these 10 coins, like the one referenced here, and they would be laced together into a headband or a necklace. And then that thing would be given to them and they would wear it during their wedding ceremony. And the closest equivalent that we have in our culture would be like a wedding dress. So it was like their wedding dress. But the difference was, today, if you wear a wedding dress and it's not your wedding, you look a little bit crazy, okay? So just helping you with that. I know you kept it afterwards and you zipped it up in the thing or whatever, so it's airtight. But that's a one-time wear, right? If you wear, like, if, if your husband comes home and you're wearing it, like, you know, whatever, he's going to get worried, okay? And so, so anyway, or if you go to the store wearing it and you buy groceries, like, right? and so anyway, there, but back then, the women would, would regularly still wear this thing. They would put it on their head. They would put it, and as they would wear it, man, they were, they were just thinking about the whole time. Like those coins represented something to them. It represented this lifelong love that someone had promised to them and that they had promised to someone else. So this, this coin was part of this physical picture of this incredible um, identity-based love right? And, and that is the tragedy that she lost it. And now you go, oh man, that's a much more valuable coin. I would definitely search for that coin because of what that is. It's not because of what it's worth. It's because of what it is. 
And so again, Genesis tells us that mankind was created in God's image and likeness. So every human being was made from a deposit of the identity of God himself. If you can hear what I'm saying, if you can understand what I'm saying, it's because you were made with a deposit of God's identity put into you. You see, our value as people is uniformly derived from that. There is nothing you can earn, nothing you can do, no matter how pretty you are, what you own, or anything else that can even add a glimmer in comparison to the, to the fact that you have a deposit of the eternal God in you that makes you who you are. You know, I love my kids, but you know what? I love them because they're my kids. And sure, they're smart and they're funny and they're well-mannered and they're talented, right? And, and, and all of that stuff is great. It makes life a little bit better and more fun, right? But I loved them before they were any of those things. I loved them before they could display any of those characteristics. My love for them is identity-based. It's based in who I am and in who they are. And God's love for the human race is based on the fact that he is our father and we are his children. And among everything in the world, we were uniquely created in his image. And so because of that, the heart of God breaks for every person who dies of starvation or of a waterborne illness or is trafficked or exploited. It breaks for that the same way it would break our heart if it were our child. And I want to go further than that because his heart breaks when people suffer hardship and tragedy that's not their fault like we just described. It's just because of where they were born. And his heart breaks when people suffer hardship and tragedy that they bring on themselves. You know, I knew this person. I still know them. I don't want to tell the story that way. It'll sound like they died. Um, and so I know this person. And when they were a small child, their mom was cooking something. And they walked over to the stove and they didn't know what it was. And it had a lot of hot boiling things in it. And they reached up and they pulled that pot off. And you know what happened next. They pulled boiling liquid down on themselves. And this small child was burnt and injured. And it's, it's horrifying, right? And I want to tell you something. Every messed up, sinful person you see, every addict, every down and out person, every broken person who doesn't understand themselves and can't figure themselves out or their identity or their whatever that is, right? Here's the reality of life. We're all that kid. And we grab pots on stoves and we unsuspectingly pull things down on top of us. And some of us are lucky. Some of us get like our toe burnt. Some of us burn our finger and we learn the lesson. Some of us bring down a mess on ourselves and we hurt and we're broken and the heart of God breaks for those people. It breaks. He doesn't write them off as a coin in the dirt and go, oh, well, they blew it. They brought it on themselves. The same way ours would break for our own kid if they did that. You see, this, this is about the third world, but this isn't just about the third world. Because our city and our friendships and our workplaces and our families are full of people who've done just that. And they need us to know and understand and live out the heart of God in response to them and their pain and their lostness. You see, that is actually why the Pharisees were criticizing Jesus. It's because he was spending so much time with people who had pulled the pots down on themselves. And so the last thought is this. Jesus invites us into God's value system. 
Jesus' entire life is a picture of God's value system. Feeding hungry people, caring for the sick, healing the sick, morally corrupt and confused people, spending his time with them, valuing children and women and other people that the rest of culture thought were completely inconsequential. Lepers, crippled people, beggars, zealots, fishermen, prostitutes, tax collectors, right? Prophets like John the Baptist, right? Uh, and, and hypocritical, misguided Pharisees. They were all the focus of Jesus' time and energy and attention and love. They all mattered. And as we live in relationship with Jesus, we're learning from his teaching and we're imitating the things he did. What should happen is that we should move toward God's value system. And as that happens, there will be breakthrough moments where we'll have those big ahas and we'll go, oh man, I had this blind spot and I really had discounted the value of these people or those people and God's really opened my eyes. And there'll be kind of a, a process that we'll have to sort through to figure out what that looks like to proceed from there. And sometimes that's not super clear, but God's going to walk with you through that. But sometimes the action is clear, right? Like with the opportunity for feed one, there are children living around the world who live with the regular reality of hunger and malnutrition. And we have the ability to change that for some, right? And so God-like love means that we respond as if it were our kid. Because that's how God responds. And I want to be clear. Sometimes we get afraid of things like this. Because the world is very broken, right? And so I know some of you are already thinking, but we can't fix it all. No, you can't. In fact, this whole program started because this one guy was doing this. And, and Mother Teresa challenged him. He said, listen, we can't fix it all. And she said, you can't feed every kid. But I bet you can feed one. And that's where the name came from. You know what? I'm not asking you to change the whole world. But I'll bet. I bet we can feed one kid, right? So, but I want to be clear about this. I want so much more for us out of today and out of this teaching than simply signing up to feed a kid. That's huge. I don't want to belittle that, but I want more, all right? I want us to take deliberate steps away from the market-based value system of this world and toward the image of God-based value system. I want us to see and love and act towards people in response to the value that God places on them. You know, as we kind of wrap this together here, you remember that house that we referred to a few minutes ago, the Johnny Cash house. Uh, you know, I'm sorry that you couldn't see the picture, but it was a very humble house. It's not nice. It doesn't have the modern features. There's none of those normal factors that make it super valuable, but, but it's probably, there it is. <laughs> it's probably, we found it. It's probably worth millions. And if you ask people who are crazy Johnny Cash fans, they would probably tell you that it's priceless, right? They would tell you that thing is priceless. And listen, its value is derived completely on whose it was. There is not a person with breath in their lungs who is not a priceless son or daughter of God. And may God enable us to more readily see the value and think and act accordingly. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your incredible love. And we're grateful that even though we don't get it so often, in grace and mercy, you continue to walk alongside of us in compassion, in all these ways, showing us what it is you've been trying to communicate to us all along. So God, I pray for us, especially today, that stuff like this is hard to talk about. It's hard to hear. It's hard to face. And we usually would rather hide from it. But God, I pray that you'd give us the courage to pull the cover back and to see the reality and to see that maybe we've attributed value to some people more than others because we're basing our entire value system on the wrong things. I pray that you'd begin to help us as we walk towards your value system and away from this one that we've inherited. 
God, may eternity be different. May the world be different. May our families be different. May our hearts and lives be different as a result of that. So we give you thanks for that. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.